once again to discuss this. Welcome to another episode of Geeky Gentlemen. I'm Sid Pardue. Joining me today is... A geek for fun. Hey, I'm not that kid. No, you're not. God Don't damn lie it. to people. <laughs> anyway, go with the I am uh, uh, the critically acclaimed and prolific comic book reviewer, Steve Baxi. Okay, good. There you go. <laughs> Stick with that one. That's good. Um, <laughs> <laughs> oh, and... Today we're here to discuss something. It's a discussion topic. I'm pretty sure it was Alfie's topic, and I honestly can't remember what it was. Well, that's because, Ian, this is your destiny. This whole time, this whole battle, it's all been about this. We're talking about Rose Gallery, and you are a member of mine. Yep, that sounds about right. Okay, Rogue's Galleries in comics, different... Okay, yeah, now that tracks now. You know, it's funny, I spent years on the show being the only one that like kept track of things, of like whose week it was, and, and remembering the topic, and I'd constantly get messaged by all the different various hosts, what are we talking about again? And I'd have to tell them, and be like, ah, oh, God, how can you not remember this? It's like so simple, and then... Child. <laughs> and now... Now it all falls upon Alfie. Uh, now Alfie's the adult in the room. I know, I please no. <laughs> but I also I also think that's just no one actually remembers a geeky data of a review top we, we always make up on the last minute. It's just it's all false. We we Ian when he uploads the next episode like edits the ending so it sounds like we actually remember, but like it's a complete conspiracy. No one ever actually remembers geeky data. If anyone no, that's break right. into one of our houses, you'll find out that we don't actually record this show anymore. Ian just has an algorithm running that simulates our voices and opinions on things, and it's 99% right most of the time. Okay, you know, actually, the funny thing is, they've, <laughs> like, deep fake technology has gotten to the point where, like, you can't, you can do audio that, like, if you have enough samples of someone's voice, you can do audio and just have them say, like, literally anything. You can just type in what you want them to say, and it'll say it in their voice, and it'll actually be pretty damn, like, on point. Um, and it's, like, it's hard to blend it with, like, video and make it look good, but deep fakes are getting, like, legit scary in that regard. Um, and I think there is probably enough content of just the two of you speaking on the internet that that we can get a pretty solid Steve Baxi deep fake going. So if anyone wanted to to have Steve Baxi, you know, speak on the the merits and moral superiority of capitalism, um, you know, there's there's your in. <laughs> anyway, technology is a nightmare and I hate it. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so anyway, rogues galleries. Um it was fun stuff. Okay, so let's just let's just get this out of the way. Um, best Rogues Gallery in DC, Batman. Uh-huh. Best Rogues Gallery in Marvel, Spider Man. Agreed. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Cool. I think just, and I think that goes to something which I think kind of goes to a good place to start. And that is, are the reasons for that because the characters themselves are just inherently better ideas for villains or is it a factor of taking kind of those are just the lucky ones that kind of got brought into popularity and then as a result got bad talent on it to make them bad you know like i what? think it's i think it's 100 percent the second one because i'm gonna ask you a question i always ask this whenever we talk about like forgotten characters or if someone goes like well how many times has the joker escaped arkham I always bring up this. Yeah, sure, the Joker has escaped about a billion times, but it doesn't mean Arkham's the least secure facility in the world. It means that the Joker's really smart. Because when was the last time Crash and Burn escaped? Oh, that's right, never, because they were only in one issue. <laughs> and it's like Batman number like 532 or some shit like that. Uh, it's, it's around a Black Mask arc when Black Mask was big in the comics. 
and they just is like a one or two issue story with these villains created for that story called Crash and Burn, who kind of had like a like a Death Wish kind of Bonnie and Clyde feel to him. And they they get like horribly mangled in an accident and get sent to Arkham. And then no one's ever done anything with those characters since. So the system's working. Um, but no, I think that's that's like also really good for your point there about just like because they weren't like a particularly clever idea or successful in any major regard, they just yeah they just stayed in Arkham or maybe they got better. That'd be like a good good pair of characters to pull out of just like no see here's an arkham success story like they got plastic surgery they're they're running like a mechanic shop or something now i don't know <laughs> yeah and i i think that's something where because those are the examples they bring up because if you really look at like first appearances for character there are some um villains which are just successive right out the box the Joker's first story is amazing. Like the, the 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 clown at midnight is just a fucking fantastic introduction to a character. He's he's the first person who outwits Batman and Robin. He successfully pulls off the the the, the way he kills the people in that issue is so good that it's been every single time we introduce the Joker, we always do that method of killing with the the glass and 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 that was that was poison. And everything that they did in the Dark Knight, they do it in. Um, uh, uh, Joker's first laugh, like the, the year one sequel, they do it in basically all the TV adaptions. They, they they always bring in that story because it is a really good introduction to the villain. You get what the Joker and Batman's dynamic is. He's not fully formed yet into what we know as Joker now, but all the pieces of that is the Bat Batman builds a box, and the Joker is the one villain who thinks outside that box and forces Batman to build another box around him and again and again and again. Like he turns the win conditions of a Batman story against him. And that what that's why he is the number one pro. Whereas you look at something like um I don't know, uh what's, a, what's an example of a famous villain? Alright, so Green Goblin. Green Goblin, really famous Spider Man kind of universally agreed that between him, Doc Ock, and Venom is like the big three Spider-Man villains with most people saying Goblin is the biggest one that, that is made that guy. Green Goblin's first intro story? I mean, it's cute, but it's not really anything to do with the Green Goblin as a character. It's him introducing is he, he goes to a movie set and he hires the Enforcers to fake a movie and then the Hulk shows up and then they run away and it's not really any kind of sell. So like, not a lot there to kind of mind, but subsequent stories kind of built upon it and stuff. And I think that's kind yeah. of a really interesting idea of like, sometimes characters need multiple drafts to work. And I think doubly so in the case of ongoing comic book villains, because it's easy enough to make a trap for one story very hard to find a character that can endlessly find new ways to threaten someone and I think that's something a lot of villains kind of struggle with and that's why someone's are just best left off as like these one-off things whereas the ones that are populated into really popular characters and stuff creatives have found new takes on them that make them have like different ongoing relationships and such. Yeah, no, I think that's a really interesting point about the, the times a character just comes in one time and then that's that's all that they really get. Um, and then sometimes they just sit on the shelf for years until someone comes up with a much better take for them to make them a recurring threat. Um, we'll try to get off Batman villains after this one, but the immediate example that comes to mind for me is uh, is Mr. Freeze, you know? where he's introduced in the in the silver age and he's mr zero and like the gimmicks all the same but it's just like he's got the helmet he he ices people he even was successful enough to be on the batman tv show with adam west but then he doesn't really like he doesn't really stick and he sits in the bin for like 20 to 30 years and then someone it's funny because grant morrison of course like even puts him in Animal Man, and and Animal Man meets Mister Freeze in the in the barren wastes of forgotten characters. Mister Freeze is like, "I'll be a big Batman villain again one day. Someone will have the take." And then shortly after that, Paul Dini on fucking Batman the Animated Series creates the take on Mister Freeze, where it'd be hard to imagine doing anything else with him after that. 
Um, so yeah, it is it is interesting how a character can acquire not only multiple drafts, but multiple drafts over decades until they really hit in any kind of way. Right. I mean, yeah. So it's, it's one of those things where... I don't know, it's just fascinating to me because Rose Galleries are such a uniquely comic idea. Like, mm. James Bond, ongoing franchise. Yeah, that's kind of where my first... I, I, yeah, it was like the first thing I thought. It was like, oh, no, not really. Like, James Bond, a lot of action movies, you got, like, a villain per movie, and sometimes they'll, like, show back up depending on how long the franchise goes. Like, I'd say... I think it's reasonably fair to say Godzilla has a rogues gallery. Yeah, right. But I, I and I, I think that's all right. Not necessarily comic, but like ongoing fiction. I, I guess I shouldn't mm-hmm. think like that. Mm-hmm. But like that to facilitate a rogues gallery, that first has to be continuity. That first has mm-hmm. to be a connecting thread of events. And even then, I think it does has to be. The Rose Gallery can't just consist of one character showing up and then another character showing up and then they never show up again, but then we just add them to the list. Like the Godzilla example you mentioned is good because stuff like King Ghidorah will constantly return, like Rodan will constantly return. Like the the, the characters have multiple appearances and different interactions. Um and they'll follow similar beats sometimes, but they do things. So like I think that is it's a it's a sea of ongoing continuity focused fiction that comics just so happen to be uh, I'd just say probably the most prolific example just from sheer quantity of like mm-hmm. per villain but like there's that thing in I think is probably one of the better ideas um, that Mark Miller ever had was the conceit in Old Man Logan where all the villains kind of get together and like yeah we outnumber these heroes like 20 to 1 <laughs> like if we just all ganged up on every single one of them at the same time we'd win and they do. And I, I think that is something which is a really fascinating concept to have into a world. And, and not, don't just have it be the DC Universe has a Rose Gallery. It's more than that. Because in like James Bond, right? Like the James Bond is the only fictional character in that universe that has those things outside of any crossovers. I don't know of a such. And he has a Rose Gallery. Godzilla has a Rose Gallery. But. The DC Universe or the Marvel Universe isn't just that. It's Superman has a Rose Gallery, but Batman has a completely different one. And then The Flash has a completely different one. And they can cross over and they can move the things to where you just have a super villain community and you can rank them against I love, things different. Yeah, I, it's so much fun when you get like the the character from X becomes the villain for for another thing. Um, fuck, I cannot get off Batman villains today. Fucking, but Riddler versus the Flash is such a good, and it's it's only like two issues. It it happened right at the end of the New Fifty Two, and it's so perfect. Um, I'm trying to think of other good examples of like, I mean, I guess you had like a Mazo versus Batman at the beginning of um of the Red Hood stuff. That was pretty decent. I mean, and I kind of consider the most famous example of all time is probably Kingpin went from a Spider-Man villain to the most iconic Daredevil villain of all time. That's a good one. I, I kind of like more just the one-offs as opposed to, like, the proper, like, full-on switch, you know? Um, but, no, that is that is a good point, too. Norman, um, Norman's also, I think, if you're going for one-offs, is another good one, because Norman Osborn's always been the, the, the Spider-Man villain, and he sort of became the Marvel Universe bad guy for a little bit with, with mm-hmm. Secret Invasion and, and uh, Dark Reign. But in the middle of that, he had probably one of the best Iron Man stories of all time in World's Most Wanted, and he became an Iron Man villain for that one arc for, like, 12 issues. Um, and it's it's uncanny when you throw characters like that together. We're like, how did no one think that the billionaire, um, the billionaire Tony Stark going up against the billionaire Norman Osborn would not inherently be interesting? Mm-hmm. No, I that's fair. That um, very same run. I think is an even better one to specifically because even then like Norman Osborn like say he's like a, a, an art and like, everyone's kind of dealing with Norman Osborn and that so it's easier to justify that with, with Tony the one that really stands out of there's no real reason this happened other than it's just a good idea is when we did Doc Ark versus Tony in that same run where oh, that was so we, good. We had, where we have Octavius as like yeah I fucking despise you 
Because at least Richards and the other scientists, at least they know, like, they're still recognizably of our kind, like, our, our, our place. Like, they're not the famous people society. I can't stand that you should have been a fucking job. You should not deserve that intelligence. You're an alcoholic. You waste it. You ruin it. You're you're, you're getting losing your memory every fucking like. He just goes off on Tony Stark of how much because Otto's whole thing right is he's insecure and he, he he wants recognition from the world and wants all these things with technology, and then he sees Tony who can't do anything but get recognition. Like oh, the Tony Stark could lose his company fifty times and bring it back the next week because he just the man just cannot fail um, no matter how mm-hmm. hard he goes and having Otto go against him with that and you get the arms versus the Iron Man armor and at that point Otto was more kind of that in that like kind of like magneto esh terror where we could just kind of control technology um it was a really interesting dynamic because it was kind of the Otto was always compared to like Peter Parker if he never got bit by the spider if like he stayed that selfish kind of prick and it's really interesting to see like that version of Otto versus a Tony um at that point where they're both similar ages and all those kind of things. I think, again, is a really good example, like the same with Flash B. Riddler, of a dynamic that was never intended, but when you put it on the page, it just clicks. And mm-hmm. I think that's something with Rose Galleries that actually can be kind of limiting sometimes, is I think the moment you designate a character as specifically, this is a insert character here villain, you kind of miss some of those great matchups that would honestly benefit them more than the hero they're assigned to. That's true, and it, it becomes more of a problem, too, when, like, they just keep using a character in a universe, because, like, I think Deathstroke used to just be kind of like a DC Universe villain. Like, he'd show up, you know, maybe, like, Titans more specifically, but he'd show up a lot as just a general threat in the DC Universe, whenever he needed, like, a a super soldier, fighter, assassin guy. And over time, he's kind of become more and more attached to just Batman. And it's kind of annoying. Um, To the point where, like, the animated movies, like, made him have kind of a rivalry thing with Batman slash Damien, and it made it weird. Um, Stuff like that got pretty old. I feel like, Uh, I don't don't know about deathstroke on that one i i am in 100 percent agreement with you that i think him being tied to batman is is problematic and dumb but deathstroke's interesting because he first appeared in new teen titans and he was just a straight up teen titans bad guy um all the way through till the late 90s um into like it wasn't until like i uh the crises in the 2000s where he became like a dc bad guy and then they tried to shop him around with a bunch of heroes. And I think this is just sort of proof of, of, of failure of Deathstroke as a concept because Deathstroke outside of Teen Titans is just not that great of a character. And so mm-hmm. do, they threw him against Green Arrow for a while and it didn't stick. And they threw him against Justice League and it didn't really stick. And then they threw him up against Green Lantern and Flash and stuff. And like he would show up and clearly be a threat, but it would just never really work. So he kind of gets relegated to being a DC Universe bad guy. Like, whenever you just need generic assassin dude, you get Deathstroke. And his ongoing that Christopher Priest did and what's coming up now with Josh Williamson and and Deathstroke Inc., I think is trying to sort of capture that zeitgeist a bit. We're like, okay, fine, Deathstroke can't seem to pin down one character to to be in a relationship with. So we're just going to make his whole thing is that he is the ultimate assassin of the entire DC Universe. Um, Lady Shiva has entered the chat. Right, and that, that's the problem is that like he literally isn't. Like it, it works in Teen Titans because this is a grown ass man who's got a petty, insecure relationship against a bunch of teenagers that perpetually kick his ass and that his children outgrow. Like Deathstroke is a is a pathetic dad, and that's what makes him the contrast to Dick Grayson and the rest of the Titans. But when you make the pathetic dad character the big dad of the DC universe, it's really hard to do that without leaning into the stuff about him that is just kind of pathetic. Mm-hmm. No, you're you're absolutely right. I just think that like there was a good long while, at least when I was first introduced to Deathstroke, where I just knew him as like a general DC universe character. I didn't really know much of the history behind him. Like I'd I'd assumed he started in Teen Titans, but I wasn't sure. Um, 
my introduction to the character was always main DC universe, just kind of you know a guy to show up, a mook, um, and and he could you know he could stand as a threat in that regard. It wasn't like the I, I don't think anyone used him as like the big bad, but he was like you know he showed up and was like it it showed you a level of of seriousness. Um, and then just seeing him get tied further and further to Batman has kind of limited him in a, in a number of ways. Um, which is interesting because like New 52 started up and, and they gave Deathstroke a new design and they even gave him like the, the little spiky things on the, the gauntlets that Batman has. I don't know what you'd call those. Um, and so I was really thinking, oh, wow, so they're, like, really tying him into Batman now. They're gonna, like, root him in the same training or something? Or, or what's the deal here? Mm. No, it just, they, they did it because it looked cool, I guess. Uh, who did we lose? Oh, Alfie's back. Yeah, yeah he's kind of pegged um, there. It's all good. Alfie, you there? No, not yet. All right, we'll see what happens. Um, anyway, um, uh, we, yeah, we can go in there. Uh, but no, you're, you're right. And I, I think something else that's kind of interesting, um... To, to kind of weed off the Deathstroke example a little bit, be in the same spirit, is um, I think that there are writers that very clearly have, like, villain agendas. Like, mm -hmm. writers that have agendas for this is their favorite character, like Tinian loves Tim Drake or something like that. But I think there are definitely th those writers who are like, I am out to tell the ultimate story with this character and only this character. Um, so I, um, you'll, I, I think a good example there is... Kevin Smith made Onomatopoeia up in Batman, in Batman, but then he used him again over in um, Green Arrow, and then he brought him back on his second half of his Batman run. And, like, he was really out there to try and make Onomatopoeia, like, stick in the DC universe, which didn't really happen because he disappeared until Ram V brought him back in Future State. Uh, but then, like, Batman, uh, not to harp on these examples, but Batman constantly have the, has this, where a writer will show up, and they'll be like, yeah, this is my favorite Batman villain, and I'm just going to make my entire run about this Batman villain. Uh, for Tom King, it was going to be Bane um, with, what's his name? With, um, with well, Dennis O'Neill created Ra's al Ghul, with what uh, Alan Burr, Alan Grant uh, came up with Anarchy, and he wanted him to be a recurring character and make a Robin eventually. Um Scott Snyder kind of wanted to tell the ultimate Joker story, which I think he sort of did, but with Endgame and then whatever happens at the end of his run. But like, yeah, there is that sort of weird uh, compulsion. Can we, can we, hold on. No, you can't just say that and expect me not to throw shade. He tried yes. and failed to tell the ultimate Joker story. No, I, I don't like his, okay. his run, so I agree with you. But I mean, I mean, I think there is something to be said for like, that was sort of the goal of his run is to tell the ultimate Joker story. Um, I mean, it would help if he understood the Joker as a character, but sure, <laughs> let's go off, I guess. <laughs> uh, but yeah, I mean, there, there is something about writers where I think they get on books um, less for the heroes sometimes, and more so just to kind of prove their case of why this character is a badass. Um, your your favorite Riddler story, Riddle Me That, um, I think to an extent has that agenda where they're like, no, the Riddler has kind of been a joke for too long. We need to like seriously consider that this dude is fucking terrifying and competent. I mean, I guess that's that's a fair enough point, but I, I guess you're kind of walking a line between trying to have an agenda for a character and someone trying to create a new pitch or a new take on him specifically with riddle me that um that's fair because i think i think real me that is just like okay the riddler has been a joke he's a super genius like everybody else in the dc universe and their brother um so let's like actually write him like a competent super genius and stuff and i think they they do a good job of that and riddle me that but this that's neither here nor there we've talked about it somewhere you just Google Sid Part 2 Steve Baxi riddle me that. I think that video is still up somewhere. Um, I'm not 100% sure that's on your channel, so I, yeah, probably. Yeah, uh, Steve deletes all his videos because he doesn't care. <laughs> um, <laughs> anyways, that's the true villain of the story. Well, I think about to, to stay on your, like, your little agenda point, uh, Steve, I, I think is interesting about that is I think you also got to consider just like as a writer, not everyone who gets put on the book of, say, Spider-Man, right, wants to write Peter Parker as their dying 
uh, like drives. They've just got the ultimate Peter Parker story. I think the thing you need to consider as well is the title of Spider-Man encompasses every single character in that mythos to where the only chance a writer is ever going to get if they've got like this really pitch perfect Doctor Octopus story is going to be in the main Spider-Man book. Like that's the only place you have to tell it. Um, and I think that's what you can get to. But I don't necessarily think it's a gender where I don't necessarily think it is a the title is this is the story you have and this is and the, the title of the book becomes the only vehicle for that to exist, right? Um, near the end, my, my favorite example of this, which I think is probably the best that's been done, um, at least in terms of fully laying it into it, is right near the end, uh, just before the New 52, where Paul Cornell took over Action Comics and it just became a Lex book for, like, those remaining issues. Like, it's the, it's the Black Ring story. Like, after Lex got mm-hmm. the orange Latin ring, he wants to get the power back and he, he goes, well, it's a great story. And it is just because they're like, I don't really have a super bad story, but I've got a fucking killer Lex Luthor pitch. And why does that need to be a separate? Why can't that just be in action comics? Like, why can't that just be the thing? And I think I, th- I wish more people be honest about that sometimes, because I think that is legitimately fine. Like that, that that's kind of kick ass, you know, like I would read um, a fucking this is my bias, you know, because I'm just going to say, but I would read a fucking X-Men story she was just entirely from Magneto's point of view. Like, Magneto's just a big they had, um, they had a Colin Bunn Magneto ongoing for a while. They did, uh, they did, they... and I read that, I read that. But, like, that's what I mean, like, just in the sake of every single thing getting a new book, I don't necessarily, for villains specifically, I don't necessarily think that's needed. I don't think you ne- you need a Joker solo book. Uh, it's fine that it's out there and I, I think it can work but I, I do think there is treating these books as when you do a run you don't necessarily always have to be doing it for the titular character uh, the Rose Gallery are, can be just as expansive if not more so than the the main character um, especially if again if a writer's got specific lean-ins to a specific tone and don't feel so confident in one character they can write the other um i think is always an interesting kind of thought experiment a little switch up can, can i can i go on my agenda real quick while we're talking about writers with agendas oh well you know we already had a lot of rick like last episode steve so <laughs> <laughs> no but like when, when you think about character villains that that come up as like one shot one and done characters for a superhero that don't risk their potential but could go off and do their own thing and become fascinating layered characters with multiple titles under their own belt if handled right. Fucking Deadshot. <laughs> Deadshot is <laughs> up in an issue with Batman as like a fucking magician who's robbing a, a party. No one gives a fuck. He shows up again and Steve Englehart's running gets the cool costume as an assassin. No one gives a fuck. Then fucking John Ostrander shows up and he's like, Deadshot's the coolest fucking villain in all of Batman's rogues gallery because he's a boss and he's right. And he makes him the star of a 66-issue Suicide Squad ongoing and gives him a four-issue miniseries. And now, at this point, no one even really remembers the fact that Deadshot is a Batman rogue um, outside of him appearing in, like, animated shows here and there. He's essentially his own character. It's even hard to label him a member of a rogues gallery or even a villain at this point because he's just so much more... He's so much more into that anti-hero lens, not because he's a good guy or an anti-hero in any sense, but because, like you were saying, he was allowed to just kind of get his own stories independent of Batman, and people realize that he's actually really fucking cool. Fair. Fair. Um, Deadshot's character with an interesting history. Um, I don't know. Villains... Villains in rogues galleries... Are, are interesting to me because of the success of them. Other characters kind of, like, are judged against their own. Um, so, like, Batman's got a very successful rogues gallery, and so people look at, like, Superman and go, like, well, who's there for Superman? Is his rogues gallery any good, even? And it's like, it. what kind of comparison is that? And then you get characters who, like, 
the point of them doesn't really make sense to have a rogues gallery. So, like, you have Wonder Woman, who's certainly got one, you know, Giganta, Dr. Psycho, Dr. Poison, Dr. Cyber, a lot of doctorates in the Wonder Woman rogues gallery. Um, Ares, And had an agenda against his co-workers, I guess. <laughs> yeah, uh, like, literally, Dr. Psycho is, is based partially off of one of his uh, professors. Um, anyway, um, but, like, Wonder Woman has a rogues gallery, but it's not, like... They it wasn't built to be one in the way of like a lot of Batman characters are created to to fit into that gallery. Like so many characters that are introduced in Batman stories, like the last scene is usually them getting locked up in Arkham to come out again, you know? Um whereas a lot of the Wonder Woman stories the villain shows up, Wonder Woman defeats them and kinda like solves the problem that created them in the first place. So like truthfully they should never show up again <laughs> um, but we we do it anyway um this and it's a, it's kind of hilarious this is also a punisher problem because oh yeah it's a rogues gallery and uh if anyone <laughs> should not have to deal with the same bad guy more than once it's probably the punisher yeah i was literally <laughs> just about to say that is that that is a character that if the if the threat doesn't end with him shooting them in the face. You've, you've misunderstood the character. <laughs> Why is Jigsaw still a thing? Why has Jigsaw died less times than fucking Batman? And you know what? I, I will actually... say this, like... Go ahead, see, go ahead. Yeah. Uh, okay, I'll say this, like... It makes sense for, like... Like, the way they use Jigsaw in, in the shitty Warzone movie actually kind of made sense, where it's like... Okay, the Punisher thought he killed him in, like, the most ironic and painful way, which is a Punisher fucking move, right? And and it works as, like, okay, that's his origin in the first act of the film, and then as the film goes on, he becomes, you know, this this threat throughout the film. But then you end the film with the Punisher killing that guy. <laughs> like, you can't... You could set it up, like, for an arc, or maybe, like, for a really long-form arc where Frank keeps trying to get to him and he can't, but, like... The idea of a recurring, like, writer-to-writer -writer villain for the Punisher is really hilarious. I think also, for the, like, a really great example of when you mentioned, like, forcing characters to have a Rose Gallery when they really shouldn't, to the idea that superhero is a genre, and this is just a Rose Gallery is now just a trope of that genre, so they have to have a recurring villain they just well why of course they do whereas like you said like a wonder woman just shouldn't not because the fucking oh, I, when i put my villains down they don't stay down who oh, jeff john's panel like fuck that shit no it's because she should just be making fred she should just be like goku where after a dark her villain just support joys a supporting cast <laughs> like, like like that's that's how wonder woman kind of should kind of operate um I think the same kind of thing could be said to a lesser extent with something like Superman. Um, but a character like Spider-Man makes sense to have a bunch of people who continuously show up because A, he doesn't kill his villains, and B, he's a fucking smartass who will get people to hold grudges very easily against him because <laughs> all he does is bully his villains. So, like, it makes sense that they'd all hate this fucking fuck. That's why Spider-Man is the unbelievable character where all his team villains teamed up into their own separate team group with the sole purpose of beating up Spider-Man. Because this fucking pug thinks he's a little, little, little cocky little shit. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and these 30-year-old, like, working class criminals just had enough of it. And I think that makes sense. Whereas, um, same thing, something like The Flash, where technically his Rose Gallery, not only are they just on the face of it called the Rogues, uh... They're all just kind of just friends. They're all just drinking buddies. Like, going after the Flash is, like, their equivalent of, like, going bowling. Like, that's their group <laughs> activity, which I think is really cool. Like, I think that's really sweet. Um, stuff like that, I think, really works for those specific characters and those specific models of storytelling. But the moment you try and make it to this, this has to be a forced thing is, I think, when you get those characters that don't last. The biggest example, I think, um, kind of me and Steve can attest to is, like, the Tinian Batman run. 
where oh, all course. these characters are being introduced as if they've got like the TM right next to the name, you know, like as if like it's, it's mm-hmm. circled, it's so transparently this character will be a new Batman villain that will get new toys and the big push and the big thing just to have it and then the moment that arc's done all right next arc here's a new one here's a new one and there's no focus on developing them as characters it's purely ip farming which i think is when the rose gallery concept gets really gross into the kind of corporate Mm -hmm. management of comic books and how it works is they don't become stories they just become ips it's just like I, i just want to say real quick and then you can go steve i've had such an experience like i've i've finally had the experience of, of our Discord server of what comic books are, are supposed to be like, I guess. Where you just find out why you're supposed to hate them based on what other people are saying. Because I've not been reading Tinian's Batman, because I kind of just, eh, to it after like two issues. And all I see is Steve and Alfie talk about how bad Tinian's Batman is. <laughs> and so like I've, I've, I've learned that I'm supposed to hate it vicariously through others. Go ahead, Steve. <laughs> I mean, you're right, and as long as we are all friends, we are all in the pack to hate Tinian's Batman. But anyway... Um, you already would, Steve. Let it go. <laughs> I got this man to quit DC Comics! He's already dead! <laughs> <laughs> no, but... Um, to, to, to not be a pathetic dead horse... Um, the opposite extreme of the same point you're making um, with, with Tinian IP farming the Batman villains, because who the fuck cares about Miracle Molly and Punchline, um, is the X-Men when Fox owned them. And the writers mm-hmm. were very strictly warned not to create new characters so that Fox could not have new characters to use in their movies. Um, Which is like really stealing the bread and butter of the X-Men, isn't it? <laughs> <laughs> It really is. I mean, I, I am happy anytime the X-Men are suffering, and I am happy anytime Tinian is not on Batman. So I don't really lose either way here, but I, I think it's interesting how there is a conception that a superhero is only as good as their rogues gallery. Um, and I think a lot of people uh, do have the correct assumption, which is that a character and their stories are are usually limited by not defined by but limited by the opposing force they go up against right like for me all of my favorite movies are my favorite movies because i find the antagonists and their challenge to the main character compelling um and so i don't think it, you can necessarily have to extrapolate it to a full rogues gallery but as long as the, the sort of like evil force the character is going up against is an interesting force on its own right it, it makes the story worth reading in my opinion but sometimes you get these situations where a character very clearly is is being shepherded in a direction and they think the way to get that character to to be a consistent force and to be something really popular is to constantly give them a rogues gallery. Um, when Miles Morales was created, when Miss Marvel was created, both of these characters were every single arc basically getting new villains because they wanted to build a rogues gallery up for them. And they successfully built up Miles and they successfully built up Camilla Khan. But no one really cares about any of the various villains. Either one of those characters were, were designed with originally. And then Nightwing's another really good example of this, where, God, Chuck Dixon, fucking rest that so- dude's soul, who tried so hard for 80 issues to give Dick Grayson a rogues gallery, and he came up with the most boring, generic mobster characters to ever exist, and we simply cannot get rid of them now. But you know what? You know what we should be grateful to Chuck Dixon for, Steve? What's that? He has given us the ultimate power scaler reference point. Blockbuster level guys. Like, tell me I'm wrong. I'm right. <laughs> right. Uh, this is a block less than level for uh, Wow, he's got block less than level for it. That is such a. I didn't even realize how that is literally in character power scale. Does Batman have a fucking tier list? He's like, this is blockbuster tier. <laughs> I know, exactly. Dixon gets a paycheck every time someone says blockbuster level. I mean, it's so true, though. Um, No, you're right. And I I think, in all fairness, that, like, to Alfie's really early on point, I think, to all fairness, 
these characters, like you mentioned, for Kamal Khan and, and Miles Morales, they're, they're villains that don't really stick, might just be an issue of this just isn't, this just hasn't had enough time to bake, and the writer's really trying to, to establish the character, and they don't really have the time to do the legwork and establish the villains in a deep, meaningful way. Um, because I... I think even the greats kind of fell back on I just I just need a guy to to kind of drive the story and they didn't want to use somebody else's character because then you're getting involved with editorial it's like oh well no they're dead this week or, or they're they you can't because they're appearing in this character's book next week whatever um, so they just create ones like I can't even remember what the fuck he's from but like I know Jack Kirby did this trick because does anyone else remember fucking Steel Hand? No. Yeah, Steel, like, I, I think, I want to say he's in New Gods, but he, it might be a Marvel thing. I just remember, like, maybe Mr. Miracle, I don't know. I just remember this fucking, like, guy who's, like, built up as a villain, and he's, like, a crime lord or whatever. And, like, his, his gimmick is he's got just, like, a metal hand, like, made of steel, and he just, like, karate chops shit, and it, like, completely crumples, like... I, like I guess maybe it would happen, but it's it, it's not like he's got super strength with his steel hand. It's just that he's got a steel hand. Um, but they they play it like he's got super strength. It's like he he karate chops like a safe and it cracks in half or some shit. Um, it's, no one fucking remembers steel hand. <laughs> guys, guys, check out my new Lego character. It's a Jack Kirby exclusive line. This is Steel Hand. It's just like a fucking guy in a suit, and he's got like one gray hand. <laughs> Wait for the the eventual um, New Gods movie, where Steel Hand shows up and is played by some sort of Oscar winning actor, and in the credits it'll be like Steel Hand, created by Stanley. Mm hmm. I mean, I gotta look this up. Hold on. Steel Hand uh, Jack Kirby. Because I'm 100% certain. Is it? Okay, yes, it is Fourth World. Oh, it's Fourth World. Okay. Uh, yeah, here's here's a image of, of Steel Hand for you. For your cats and dogs. And I, again, I think this is like... I, I'm reasonably sure he's in like Mr. Miracle or, or somewhere in that Fourth World omnibus thing. Um, maybe he shows up against Orion. I honestly can't remember because he's just so inconsequential to the story that he's in. Yep, Mr. Miracle number one. Okay, there you go. Yeah. It's fucking Steel Hand <laughs> is a Mr. Miracle villain. Fucking, you know who's really trash? Who's got a really trash rogues gallery? Mr. Miracle. Who the hell is this Dark Seed guy? <laughs> Mr. Miracle's real arch nemesis at the end of the day is is himself. Exactly, it's himself <laughs> and toy Batman that kill babies. Uh huh. <laughs> nice, nice. Um, the the other quick thing while we're on this about um forgettable characters and, and stuff is. It's interesting when you look back at some of these comic book characters that have been around for, for decades. Um, and we talk about, like, how great Batman's Rogue's Gallery is and Superman's is. And I think um, if you if you did a tier list, not to t tier things, but, you know, Spider-Man and Batman, as we said, are number one. And just below that, I think you can make the argument that Flash and Superman have, like, the next best tier of, of Rogue's Galleries. But I, I think to build off your point, something that we forget is that a lot of these characters that became iconic became iconic at very different points in the character's history over the course of decades and decades. And we know them as a rogues gallery now because as far as all of us have been alive, all of these characters have been alive longer. But, you, I mean, Hugo Strange is a really good example of this because Hugo Strange shows up once in the early Batman stories in, like, 1939, dies, comes back, like, 10 years later, dies comes back like 30 years later dies and then comes back again and kind of just stuck around um riddler not Riddler, poison ivy didn't show up until i think the 60s um man bat didn't show up until the 80s raza ghoul was in the 70s like batman has the greatest rogues gallery in comics but he also has with the exception of joker riddler 
Penguin and Catwoman, like a good ten years between every new character that that became a mainstay. And what I think is interesting, yeah, because like about... Harley would be a '90s character. Yeah, Harley is a '90s character. Uh, Doctor Hurt, uh, which isn't even I think an iconic one per se, but that's a newer character. Bane, uh, Court of Owls. Bane, the Court of Owls. The Court of Owls is not even ten years old, or it would be ten years old at this point or this year. I'm trying to think if there's like a new character introduced in the two. Th- Maybe no, because Black Mask was the '80s, but he got like a big hit in the 2000s. Hush. Hush. Yeah. Now, Hush isn't like a. Does Hush really count as like a mainstay Batman? Yeah, he's very uh, Hush and yeah. Bad man. Those are probably the two biggest, most iconic new Batman villains that have been out there since the 2000s. I hope. Well, Hush, no one's literally. No one has done another good thing with Hush, and even Hush wasn't good. I so, know, like, yeah, it's not I, I think bad, Hush yeah. will fade to obscurity. I think, I think Hush is going to fade to obscurity. Give it like another 10 years. The thing um, I remember I, specifically is I I remember um, when Arkham City came out, one of the side missions was like you found Hush, and then mm-hmm. Hush like, and they used the one, they used the Paul Dini story instead of his actual origin. Yeah, exactly right. And he's he's, he's one of the uh, things, and then everyone, everyone on the internet was just like, oh my god, so hard for Hush. Hush going to be the next Batman villain in uh, in the next Batman sequel. It's gonna be so fucking good. And then people just complained. When Arkham Knight just kind of did him as a side mission, which I was thankful for because fuck Hirsch, I don't care. But people, I, that was that's a sign to me that you, you've reached a, a level of kind of mainstream popularity is when the video game crowd are clamoring for you. When, when you have Hush theory videos, I think you've made a. Well, and, and the okay. about Hush, which sort of ties into this point, is that the companies will sometimes and i don't mean this word in a bad way um if it came off that way earlier but just in general the companies will sometimes have an agenda with how these characters are created and marketed because jim lee and jeff Loeb on the ongoing batman title for a year was a really big fucking deal in like 2003 or 4 whenever that story came out and so mm-hmm. hush is never going out of print hush has for good or bad some of the most iconic images of Batman in the 21st century because of Jim Lee and, and Jeff Loeb, even though I really fucking hate that story. And I, I don't think Hush is going to fade up to, into obscurity for the simple fact that you will never be able to go to a bookstore and not find a copy of Batman Hush. Mm, that's fair. That's fair. One thing where... Um... Like in terms of the Rose Gallery thing that I do think is at least an interesting little thought experiment because I've I, I, I thought about this a couple of times and when we were writing DC we always think of like new characters would be interesting to pair about the other ones are there any villains and it's going to be from Marvel or DC where you legitimately think you'd want to swap them permanently like if you could pick a permanent swap to give them to someone else do you have any any ones you'd pick specifically? Because I know who mine would be. Are you talking like cross company or just? No, just just like oh, okay. You know, it, it can be. It has to obviously it have to be something that would be possible to do. Okay, okay. Um, why don't you go first and let me let me try to think of one for you. My one is I would give Doomsday to the Flash. Okay. Because That's I think. Really because I think the the fucking the move, move with the Flash is he's all about speed and dodging and evasion. And we tried it a little bit when we introduced the like that strength force thingy, but it mm-hmm. didn't really go anywhere. Didn't fit I think... Because Superman has Diamond as a strong guy to fight. He's got Mongol, he's got Darkseid, he's got fucking Rogel Zar, he's, he's got multiple different Doomsdays. And, and the regular Doomsdays kind of lost his luster around Superman. Um, but the Flash doesn't really kind of have a bruiser. Like, an actual threatening bruiser. Like, a, a thing where just because you're fast and you can never hit it, and it, it can never hit you, doesn't solve the problem because you need to be able to stop it from hitting other things. Like, that kind of whole threat of where the Flash can't run away. Like, he has to stop this head on because there's nothing else to think, and you have to multitask and how does he... And the idea of, like, Doomsday, where, like, the Doom, Doomsday always comes back different and always adapts... I think goes really well with the idea of the Flash being able to be that uh, ultimate improv guy, like, on the fly. I just think that dynamic would be so much more, like, 
it would make the writers have to think more with Doomsday of how to stop it than Superman punches him harder to this time, you know? Like, I, I think that would benefit both characters a lot more. Um, or hurt them more because the writers constantly let you down. <laughs> that's true, but in an ideal well, in an ideal world, I wouldn't have to swap away Doomsday because I just rework Doomsday into something better. But if I had to keep mm -hmm. Doomsday exactly as he was, I think a simple trick would just give him to the Flash, and it would be a lot more interesting. No, that is, that's a good point. It's a good point. Steve, you got anything off the top of your head? So I've got two. One is kind of half-baked because I just thought of it. The other is one I thought about in the past. Uh, the half-baked one that I think might be kind of interesting is, and this is not totally, totally fair, and I recognize uh, the sort of importance this character has to, to his own rogues galley right now, but um, Mirror Master would be a really fucking cool Green Arrow villain because... Mm. One, you've got, like, that really sort of basic pedestrian blue-collar dude going up against Oliver Queen, which would just be kind of cool. Um, Mirror Master's actual powers make Green Arrow just shooting him with arrows really difficult. Um, and also, you could actually do something where you, you reinvent um, Mirror Master's motivations a bit, because... There's been a few versions of him, but I, I kind of like the 90s Wally West take where he's just like this pedestrian Scottish dude robbing banks to screw them over to, just to kind of prove that he can, almost kind of like in a, in a Captain Boomerang way. Uh, and I think you give him that and with, with like a deeper interrogation of why he does it, and he could make like a really cool Green Arrow villain. But again, that's kind of just a half-baked idea, and Mirror Master is such an iconic Flash villain, it's kind of hard to pull that. Uh, in the same way, in the, for the same reason, I didn't end up picking Norman and, and Tony Stark. Because I would love Tony Stark and Norman Osborn to just be the default bad guys with each other. But you can't do that to Spider-Man. <laughs> um, so so my, my other one, my other real one, is as much as I love this character and the stories that they show up in, um, fucking make Ra's al Ghul a Superman villain. Ra's Oh. makes so much more sense if he's got a bone to pick with Superman as opposed to Batman. Because with Batman, you've got like the whole sort of like, okay, yeah, you're you're the greatest son of Gotham and you're peak physical perfection, but I am immortal and I want you to use my resources to, to sort of save the world. I don't like the idea that Ra's al Ghul would just kind of be impressed with a pedestrian getting really, really jacked. I think from Ra's al Ghul's perspective of being alive for hundreds and hundreds of years, he would have met people like Batman his entire life. And it's, it's impressive that Batman can beat him, but it's not impressive that a human being could become Batman, at least not in his mind. But fucking Superman shows up out of the stars one fateful day 30 years ago, and it just fucking wrecks Ra's al Ghul's idea of the course for humanity, and he needs to take the dude down. I think that would work so much better and just let Batman have Talia. You know what would be really cool with Raish, specifically with that, and I've got to thank Ian for this, uh, for, for getting me to read it, but you know that issue of Sandman mm. where he meets, where he every, every day, every late couple of hundred years, he goes and meets the immortal, the immortal guy, the guy who can't die and has just like a drink with it, right? Mm. So like, Raish will meets Superman and he's like, this is where we stand. This is your method for saving the world. This is my method of saving the world. We will see who actually ends up with this. And the thing you can do with Superman that you can't deal with Batman is Superman doesn't age. So you can do, like, hundreds in the future. Environmentalism has improved. Or like, you can Whatever way you decide to take it, whatever argument you can do, because you can flip-flop. Like, some centuries, maybe it does succeed, but then it backslides, but then it doesn't. And you can have Superman and Raish have these different battles where... They're not each other's, like, you know, a really cool way to justify it, so to keep him as a Batman villain, is like, oh yeah, Batman's like my, like, hobby, but my real villain is Superman, it's just we only meet every 50 years. <laughs> like, that's why, all, all my battles with you are just leading up to my annual one battle with Superman that happens every fucking kind of, and then eventually you get to the fucking last three where you got Superman 1 million. And fucking Raish is still there. And now they're in like the Legion of Superhero Times and fucking Raish just like, alright, you win. <laughs> like, that'd be great. That'd be, that'd be fantastic. 
Razor Ghoul and Superman are like the actual arch nemeses, and Batman is just to Roz like a summer fling from college a few years ago. <laughs> Yeah, it's just like he keeps him. He keeps him. He keeps him on his toes. He, he keeps him nice so he's not bored. Mhm. Mhm. Um. So I was trying to think of like a good gag one where I could just say a villain I don't like and say give him to Wonder Woman and then they don't have to appear anymore. But I couldn't think of a villain that I, I like would want to just write out of comics like that. Um. Maybe make Stephanie Brown a villain and then give her to Wonder Woman and then we don't have to deal with Stephanie Brown anymore. I don't believe you. Um. <laughs> um i honestly I, I don't know i'm so bad at, at getting put on the spot like this because i just i'm sitting here i'm like thinking and thinking i'm trying to think of one and just nothing's nothing's clicking uh the best i could come up with and again i think this is just because i'm on the spot and also because i'm a hack is i think brainiac would make an interesting wonder woman villain because it's one of those things where you can justify the keep coming back side of things and like brainiac's not human it, you can do like the the brainiac is just the the cold machine machine that has come to like a absolutely a logical conclusion through logical means so there's really no reasoning with it like uh, you know it, 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 it of course depend on your version because if you did like the Kalu and brainiac this wouldn't work but like if you just do the brainiacs like no my purpose is to obtain all knowledge the only way for me to do that is to make sure that it stops so i go to a planet i and I suck up all its information and then I blow up the planet so it can't create any new information then I move on like that's just there's nothing to you can't reason with that like you said well you shouldn't do that well then I would not have a purpose to exist so I'm going to keep doing that like that side of things as a Wonder Woman villain could be at least conceptually interesting and and it could work to to keep her to keep coming back yeah. with her having to deal with it you know what, what's the, that the fucking thing that you touched on here that you didn't like why well, you're a fucking genius because i'm gonna say that uh -huh. you're gonna be like oh shit all right so see uh -huh. diana fucking kicks brady x ass fucking has him on the ground is like you're a monster how could you do this take worlds away from their cultures and bottle the book this is illogical that is what the gods did for your people. Uh, Famous yeah, Garrow is the Bottle City. Uh-huh. See? See? The yeah, Wonder Woman goes to the Bottle Cities and sees that every single one of them has, like, progressed like a culture in the same way that Famous Gara has. And then there's, like, a you could parallel that one of there's someone in the Bottle City who wants to be the Wonder Woman of it. And then she's like, well, shit. This did help the Amazons because it removed them from a toxic environment, and he's done this. But shit, shit, like you see exactly right. There's a fucking parallel there. It's very scary. Is a bottle too. Shit, see, I got this. Uh, <laughs> side note: This has nothing to do with anything. Um, did either of you watch? Yeah, you, Alpha, you and I watched Krypton season one. Steve, did you watch it at all? I didn't. That's how it looked dumb. It's it's not great, but it, it works with the best with what it's got. Um, but I really liked the take for the Bottle Cities in that one, because, like, Brainiac's purpose as just, like, the collecting of information about to save one city, it was like, well, then it's creating new information. What the fuck are you doing? Um, I really liked the take of that. It's like, oh, yeah, no, he saves one city. And then every person in that city is petrified forever, still thinking, still painfully aware of everything, but stuck exactly where they are because that's how Bradyak wants them ah oh, so good it's like i if if next time Bradyak shows up in the comics i hope they steal that because that's so fucking good i agree i, agree. <laughs> I really like that i think that's a, a much better take on it as well yeah anyway go on i'm sorry uh, uh not a not a pitch per se but um dr psycho dr poison scarecrow poison ivy Mr. Freeze, Hugo Strange, 
can we just start like a super villain PhD team? That'd be that'd be pretty good. I should because of academia. <laughs> I should really fucking message um the guy that runs Super Team Family about that because he'll do those like those team up covers where he just comes up with a theme like he did the the circus team where he had like Nightwing and Ghost Rider and Dead Man and like the fucking a uh, nightcrawler and a bunch of other characters who have like an origin connected to the circus as like a team and so just a, a villain team up where it's all just the doctorates um that's pretty good of doom <laughs> led by dr doom let's go <laughs> <laughs> they have PhD in death. <laughs> like, all right, so let's see here. Let's try to do this. So we got Doctor Doom, Harley Quinn, Jonathan Crane, Hugo Strange, Mister Freeze, Poison Ivy, Mister Freeze, Poison Ivy, Doctor Poison, Doctor Psycho. Um, are there like Superman villains that are Doctor Selfie? Um. The leader has a dot PhD, I think. Um, okay, the leader know. from Marvel. Okay. Uh, uh, Doctor Hurt. Okay. Thomas Wayne. Doc the doctor. <laughs> <laughs> Jesus, this is a big ass team. This is fucking stacked. Use <laughs> those, those fucking PhD classes with your student loans, and you are a super villain. <laughs> Sorenic Natu was a villain for a while and a doctor, so that could she could be on the team. Shit. Was um, Hank Henshaw a doctor? I don't know. Who? Hank Henshaw? Yeah. Uh I know he was an astronaut and sometimes you get like the scientist kind of astronaut thing, but I think he was like supposed to be the more like the military grade astronaut right, kind of thing. Right, right, yeah. All he's astronauts a... are military, but you know what I mean. He's not officially a villain, but I mean, if you read X Men comics, he's basically a villain. But the Beast has a PhD. Wait, what the fuck? Why? Why is the Beast a villain in the X Men comics? Why is the only good X Men a villain? Why? Uh, um, <laughs> the, just the last like ten years or so, the Beast just keeps doing terrible shit to people. Uh, did they just decide to like stop do having Charles Xavier do that and start giving it to Beast? Is that was that the just in different ways? <laughs> um, yeah, no, I'm I'm sure we're all blanking on a million other characters that have PhDs or doctorates of some kind. Yeah, fuck, that's that's a fucking stacked team. I like that idea though. I think yeah. fun. I think it'd be great if they like rotated out like the Suicide Squad because some of them have like fucking conference. They gotta go to a conference. <laughs> so Jonathan Crane can't be here this week. He's in Geneva for a week talking about fear. <laughs> oh man! I would pay so good. much money for this book now. <laughs> well, it, you know what it sounds like? It sounds like the fucking Seven Soldiers of Victory thing, where like you just go to the like the little convention of like all the weird super freaks that like. They got superpowers, but they're not villains or heroes. They're just, like, still people, and, and so this is the only way that they know to make money anymore. And so it's just, like, it'd be like that, but it's, like, the doctorates. <laughs> it's like, yeah, well, you know, we're all doctors, but because of our crimes, we can't go to conferences anymore. But that was a really useful way to learn and, you know, share information with colleagues and everything. So the villain doctors decided to, to start their own conference committee where they just get together and they start sharing, like, ideas for evil schemes. No, 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 I got it, I got it, I got it, okay. Okay, so you know how in academia you basically you publish or perish, you publish several articles a year or else you're not going anywhere and it has to be in a prestigious journal. So, like, what if one of these guys decides, all right, I'm going to start my own academic journal, except you have to have a doctorate or a PhD of some kind and be a super villain. So all of these characters, to keep their credentials, just periodically publish in this doc in this journal for super villain doctors. And then when it gets big enough, they decide to take it corporate and really take over the world, and they name it Substack. <laughs> lead up to that joke <laughs> I, I need this to happen now come on DC you need to uh, this. Man, I like this I like this 
So we're getting to the point of Geeky Gentleman episode where we're just getting silly. Is there any other, like, major things with rogues galleries we wanted to talk about? Uh, Joker is overexposed and boring, and I don't want him in anyone's rogues gallery at this point. Just, you know, let him chill for a few years. Uh, no, Joker is fine. It just needs people who can actually write him, and he's fine immediately. <laughs> that's my that's my opposite take. Is Joker isn't overexposed. It's just, we just keep giving him to people who don't get it. But the moment someone who gets it writes Joker, everyone loves it. Yeah. Nah, no, Alfie's right. right. Steve is wrong. In the, in the last fifteen years, there have been two people who got Joker, and they used him like twice each. So I, don't I know, know both. Great. Yeah. Right. I know, but it was like twice each. That's not that. Yeah. You're not disproving my point, Steve. You're proving it. <laughs> like, okay, here's the thing about the Joker. Joker is a really good villain for a single story. He's a really bad villain for like a huge epic arc and so the problem is all the other people that don't understand the joker keep trying to use him as the villain for a huge epic arc where like most great joker stories are like maybe four issues I'm gonna you know that sound bite and i'm gonna put it out on youtube as a review for tinian's joker war even though you haven't read it but you are absolutely right yeah, like, I'm trying to think of a really great Joker story that's, like, longer than an OGN, you know? It's, like, really rare when they are when they do that. Like, the best Joker stories is just shows up and shit goes fucking nuts. Um, <laughs> like, he's a really good movie villain for that reason, because he works really well in just, like, that st- single contained space. But, like, the second you start putting him in just, like, arcs and, like, master plans where he's predicting everyone's movements for, like, fucking years in advance, it's just, no. No, stop it. He just shows up to, like... Again, bad movie, but I do like this about it. The Joker's like, oh, yeah, no, it's okay, Gotham. I know I tried to poison you with, with like, stuff in my in your uh, beauty care products and everything. I'm sorry, let me make it up to you. I'm gonna go downtown. I'm gonna put on a parade. I'm gonna give away millions of dollars in the street. And you know what happens? Can people show up? It's beautiful. It's the most Jokerized thing I can ever think of. And after fucking a year and a half of COVID, tell me I'm. Tell me he's wrong. Tell me he is wrong. Damn you. And I mean the two, the two, two of the most famous Joker stories of all time. Maybe not the most famous, but up there in the top five are, are Joker's Five Way Revenge and Laughing Fish, and those are both one issue each. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. I mean, like. That's not, it's not like it can't work, because, I mean, Last Laugh is fucking fantastic, but, you know. It's like a mini, though, too, isn't it? It's six issues, yeah. plus there was, like, all the tie-ins, but, like, you can do your Joker as, like, the big mastermind thing. It it can work, it's just, you can't do it every fucking week. <laughs> yeah, I mean, like, like, what? You think of the best Joker stories of all time, and you got Killing Joke, which is an OGN, you got mm-hmm. Revenge and Laughing Fish, which are issues each. You've got um, Morrison's Clown at Midnight, which is one issue. You've got War of Jokes and Riddles, which is one eight-issue arc. Um, mm-hmm. And he's, he's sharing the spotlight there, and he's out of character for a good chunk of it. Um, fucking what else? Um, the, all the greatest episodes of him animated is just when he shows up one time with like a random bit. Yeah, fucking um, the Laughing Bat. From the Batman? Laughing Bat is yeah. fucking good, yeah. Yeah, absolutely adore that. Um, you know, it's, it's, it's crazy. Big quote-unquote Joker stories, he's really not the center of attention. Like, he's in Long Halloween, but, like, he's in it for, like, three scenes. <laughs> he's in it for one issue, and then he shows up twice. Yeah. You know, that's it. it. Yeah. Um, Joker's Asylum is a pretty good series, but he just, like, takes a different role in that. He's not really the focus of it. Yeah, just... Interesting, interesting stuff with the Joker. Um, Echoes of the Night, he's only in one issue, one episode. And the writers kept trying to use him for a bunch of other episodes, but they didn't understand the character or the bit, so they didn't. he didn't show up for the other episodes. Um, <laughs> they don't fucking listen to this show. They don't fucking listen. <laughs> that caught me off guard, man. That caught me off guard. <laughs> Oh, 
man. It's just like, I don't know. I don't know. It's, 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 it's an interesting thing. I got one Anyone? last thing I want to I wanna do round robin before we end this episode because we are getting really silly and it's getting late. Um, but... It's getting late. It's fucking 9.30. I know. <laughs> <laughs> um, okay, okay. So excluding the big ones and you, I mean you all know what the big ones are with like Flash and Superman and Batman and Spider-Man all them what is your favorite rogues gallery that is not filled with household name characters fuck um I mean I guess I get to say Green Lantern cause like I guess people know Sinestro but like fucking Atrocitus and Larflees and the other King Shark and or yeah the other King Shark and fucking the the Weaponers of Quard are all like far from household names um so I guess I get to default to Green Lantern like a basic bitch so there I'm just gonna I'm gonna be secure in that one <laughs> the tattooed man no one fucking knows who that is I'll, I'll mirror you a little bit uh, because my answer was going to be Green Arrow because of fucking like Count Vertigo and Onomatopoeia and Merlin and just like all of those other like dumb fuck villains who show up and no one cares about. <laughs> my one is I don't know if it counts because they've got like the bigger name right but they also don't like people don't associate the bigger names with them and then there's the other ones that no one talks about and that would be the fantastic four is i think the fantastic four is the jack kirby's best rose gallery he made for characters like you've got the fucking trifle four you've got the fucking annihilus you've got fucking obviously dr doom and galactus are like the huge ones but um you got the Mole Man and all these kind of things are just fun <laughs> characters to have around in Fantastic Four runs. And whenever they show up, they're very useful to like other Marvel characters to just have around because they flesh out the world so much. They they they, they take mm-hmm. you different things. I mean, Black Panther of all people started out as a Fantastic Four like antagonist. So just it's just the issue because he's quickly revealed to be a good guy, but like the first like the famous cover is him about to strike the fantastic four um claw as well as a fantastic four villain like there's i think there's a really good like just batting average of not the greatest in the world minus stop the doom of course but really just fucking solid villains uh in the fantastic Mm -hmm. four that don't get a lot of love I mean, you mentioned Mole Man and black panther so i just got to talk about one of my favorite things from hudlin's black panther run where Mole Man tried to invade Wakanda by, like, digging into it, and they, they like, hold him for a little while, and then his advisors are talking to T'Challa, and he's like, oh, yeah, let him let him go. And it's like, he invaded our sovereign soil. We can't just let him go. We need to punish him. And he's like, he's the Mole Man that's punishment. <laughs> I, fuck, I fucking love it. We do that with fucking stilt man and Daredevil all the goddamn time, and I love it every time. <laughs> all right, uh, I think that'll do it. Um, who's who's weak is it? Because Steve picked Suicide Squad, so I guess it's my turn for a review. Yes. Um. Okay. Believe it or not, we haven't done it on this show in its almost ten year history. Oh. Um. But it kind of came up tonight, and I know there's some some difference of opinion on it. So I thought it'd be, I thought it'd be time to to do an episode talking about it. Let's review the Killing Joke. Um, the animated movie or the no. comic or the comic. Okay, cool, cool, cool. I mean, if I'm talking about the Killing Joke, I would say the animated movie. Like, I know, I was just being a dick. You know, like, like, what killing joke? Who wrote this? <laughs> I am his favorite writer. Alan who? <laughs> Alan Less? Um... <laughs> right. I, can't, I can't wait to obnoxiously go on my tirade about coloring. It's going to be great. Yeah. Oh, I guess I guess that is <laughs> worth note. Should we review the original color or the one where the pages got like re- repossessed and uh, recolored by? Um, I mean, I think fuck. we've seen both of them. I think I think that's just something where we can talk about like that. 
We could probably okay. mention them both. And to be honest with you, I've read that book so many Bold. times and in so many versions, I don't actually know which coloring I even own at this point. Fair enough. Fair enough. Um, yeah, sorry. Boland. Uh, so Alan Moore and Brian Boland's The Killing Joke. We'll go ahead and uh, we'll do a review of that. Um, all right, everyone. Thanks so much for watching. Until next time, I'm the Philosopher. I am the champion of the oppressed. And I am the world-renowned and critically acclaimed and highly successful comic book reviewer, Steve Baxey. And we are your geeky gentlemen. And we will be discussing things. Do-do-do-do-do-do-do-do-do-do-do-do-do-do-do-do-do-do-do-do-do-do-do-do-do-do-do-do-do-do-do-do-do-do-do-do-do-do-do-do-do-do-do-do-do-do-do-do-do-do